Hello, I'm Show Studios editor Hetty Malik, and we're going to be talking about Paris and what happened this season of Spring Summer 24. Um, one of the biggest conversations I've really been having with people and that I've also really felt from the collections this season is this battle between consumerism um, and creativity, the idea of commerce, the need to sell. Um, you know, really today in 2023, fashion is more of a global business um, a money maker than it ever ever has been before. It's run by CEOs and conglomerates who have a business point of view rather than a creative artistic point of view. Um, designers' goals when they leave school now seem to be, you know, increasingly talking to designers and tutors. It increasingly feels that designers are leaving art school or, you know, they're studying because they want to become a creative director. There's less and less seems to be a desire to have your own kind of brand and artistic outlet and rather to um to kind of oversee a global business which is which is a very different it's not a different thing but you know i think people often forget that fashion really is a business but it seems that people are becoming maybe even more hyper aware than they realize because the goals are changing and people are desiring these these big positions really um but actually it doesn't have to be so depressing and it doesn't have to be so sort of binary. Um, I think Sarah Moore wrote about this idea of the binary between creativity and commerce in one of her reviews this season and I really thought that that was a good way to look at this um, because I haven't felt like it has to be that binary and there are definitely designers this season who, who got it right and managed to tread the line between wearable clothes and sellable product and also containing and keeping that sense of excitement, creativity, a certain level of a fantasy um, for this season um, as well and really this season the most successful designers were the ones who who saw fashion as both of both of those things who recognized it as not only a business but as something which needs to provide a reality for people like clothes that people want to wear can wear want to engage with um, and feel that they can engage with as well and I think when we're making clothes that have a certain reality to them, especially thinking about this in the context of the women's wear season, it can be about freeing the customer or consumer and giving them a freedom for expression, a freedom to dress. And, um, you know, in this case, the woman doesn't have to be within, live within the confines of the fantasies of a designer, um, especially male designers who have really dominated this season and often place their fantasies upon us as women. Um, and I really feel like this is another important conversation that's that's bubbling away and will come to a head. The thing about women and fashion is that we're not just clothes horses. We're not there to just look pretty. You know, the best things this season were things which had intellect, which were clever, which were intelligent and reflected that women are clever and intelligent too. Um, so who were some of those designers this season that we should be thinking about, excited about, and that are getting it right? Well, Y Project and Glenn Martins. Glenn Martins is just going from strength to strength. It feels that he can do no wrong. Um, just last week, he had his Diesel show in Milan, which was attended by thousands um, of members of the public, um, particularly from universities and art schools who are invited to an NTS radio rave, which then ended with the runway show. Why Project really is Glenn. And it is within this idea of Paris and this idea of high luxury, but it's also within this idea of, of recognizability. It's all, all about these wardrobe staples, which Glenn puts a twist to. Glenn is one of those rare and few designers who has a very clear aesthetic and signature, but then continues to surprise us each season. This collection was was a really brilliant showing from Glenn and all that he does so well. Those twists and turns quite literally and the kind of, they come from an understanding of the construction of clothing and being able to bend with and to play those rules. You know, I brought up Diesel at the beginning in that audience because this Y Project show was definitely infiltrated by fans on this, young fans on the street who had managed to sneak their way into the show. And, um, you know, I ended up sitting on the floor and the and the um, photographer's picks, my seat was gone and I actually didn't mind that at all because it was probably one of the best views in the house. But that feeling of the buzz and, you know, these people had obviously broken in and they loved it. You know, that's a sense of a fashion show that you don't really feel much. Um, so, you know, at, at 
what I'm also getting at is underneath the skill of this design language, this aesthetic, um, this aspiration, this was all also product that could be that can be worn and sold and that presents this story and this idea on the runway but then will translate into stores and that's why it has this audience because they can and they want to buy into it. Um, another brilliant designer, Jonathan Anderson over at Le Hueve. Um, Jonathan has been at Le Hueve for about 10 years now so he really, you can feel that he really understands the brand. He he understands what he wants to do with it. Again, in a similar, but his very much own vein to Glenn, Jonathan has his own little knacks, his own um, very distinct approach to design. He always kind of has these surprises which have very much thrilled and delighted, not just the fashion industry, but actually the general consumer. You know, you think of the Loewe bumper bag, these great accessories, but then also, you know, strange and wonderful, but weirdly wearable clothing as well. You're seeing people actually wearing these clothes on the street while as it's still presenting these new ideas of silhouette, of fantasy. It shows exactly that you can balance commerce and creativity and do it really, really well. And um, this season was another great example of Jonathan doing that, whether it be the incredibly high-waisted trousers, which literally go up to the boob, um, and they had an inbuilt corset in them, um, or the, so those kind of very wearable trousers, or then the kind of the almost humorous kind of safety pins put through the waistbands of shorts and then the be there was a beautiful lemon yellow dress at the end as well. It was also interesting because Jonathan said that he's particularly excited and interested in the idea of the everyday wearer and everyday clothes and you could really feel that in this collection which you know as I say has those wardrobe staples but with with different interesting kind of twists and turns the ending section to this collection had these bags slung on shoulders and then the coats would up this kind of suede coats would work their way into the bags as if they would kind of got caught and they were interconnected and it's these interesting kind of plays that Jonathan does on things that make you look twice which is kept this brand so exciting. Loewe is kind of always on the list index. It's always the top as the hottest brand, the brand that's actually translating to sales and to product. Um, so yeah, Jonathan is absolutely acing it. Um, then we have Casey Cadwallader at Miglair. Um, he's been there since 2017. And this collection was interesting because we're coming off the back of um, Moodler's H&M collaboration, which was an absolute sellout. Um, and Casey wanted this collection to be a break from the products that were sold at, at the H&M collab, so the spiral jeans and that kind of spiral silhouette that also works its way up into tailoring. And really you could feel in this collection that it was about breaking away from those kind of staples that he's established and moving more into the kind of fantasy and the evening wear of Mugler. So that creativity that we're talking about but actually still felt again like wearable product mixed in with kind of your red carpet, your more editorial looks. And um, you know, we've talked a bit about the idea of actually who is buying this, who's who's it accessible to. Casey's done a brilliant job of really building this kind of world and community again that people clearly want to be a part of because of that H&M collaboration selling out um, in this show we had a standout kind of line of, of models and personalities walking everyone from Amber Valletta um, and amazing kind of Angela Bassett um, who else did we have we had a oh, Paris Hilton how could I forget Paris Hilton Jill Courtlev, you know, an amazing kind of cast of people, each with their own personalities and walks, part of this kind of mood-led tribe. Um, it was nice to see Casey this season leaning a bit more into his own personality again. He was thinking about the inspiration of the sea, using that to really up the ante of fantasy in the clothes. That was particularly effective as the models were walking past hanging wind machines and then chiffon would float out from the back as if they were underwater. And again, the idea of being under the sea and some of these more extravagant show pieces such as 3D printed um, glass kind of body shields and bulbous hips, which are really beautiful. And then also some kind of jellyfish like um, sparkly looks, which also reminded me slightly in their shapes of the angel perfume adverts. You know, and with with all that, you've got your you've got your kind of take on the Moodler archive tailoring, 
but done through Casey's eye kind of look to this deconstructed tailoring so sliced apart you know bearing lots of skin but then the still intense power and structure again the fantasy of moved layer but threaded through into wearable clothing and product which you can feel but also manages to give us an amazing theatrical show an amazing cast a moment a serious fashion moment if there's someone in fashion and a brand in fashion that can give you a moment it is Mesa Margiela and John Galliano um, what a show this was at the Mesa Margiela HQ and what an absolute exercise in in being a master of craft a master of creativity but also actually you know I don't think people think about John Galliano as kind of a product first designer because he's not because he follows his creativity and his mind but in that having skill of understanding the body the construction around the body and clothes he, what actually comes out is is a lot of incredibly wearable product and I think that might go amiss miss at people looking at this show but actually again this is a brilliant example of how you do both perhaps the best of the whole season really um you know John has such a training and kind of and an obsession with couture garments and every season we see him unafraid to kind of turn garments inside out deconstruct them to make to make the inside the outside to make it beautiful and um, those elements of you know I think it's reductive to say it's DIY but you know elements like the court shoes in this collection were then kind of it was like um kind of patchworked old shoes that you think you would find in maybe like a charity shop with this kind of silver lace on them but then they're bounded together with black duct tape and somehow it works you know you've got these kind of exaggerated um kind of not cloche hats but kind of couture couture silhouette kind of 40s 50s hats but done in cardboard um you've got pvc plastic over satin you know you've got all these all these contradictions but that through the eye of Galliano and Margiela the styling of Olivier it it works and, it, and it's and it makes you sit back and you're really kind of speechless actually and you feel like this is the fantasy of fashion but actually when you look closer the fantasy and the amazingness of it is actually because it's about this rawness this reality this understanding of clothing um, and and of the body and and how you know I think even looking at each individual model who takes on a different walk um, a different character they really embody their looks you know that is what clothing really good clothing and fashion at its best should do and I think when people say all oh, fashion is fantasy I actually think it's about fashion is what gives you identity and character and that's exactly what the clothes at Mesa Margiela do and that's exactly what John's clothes do and what they do together and that's what they did for Spring Summer 24 and it was absolutely kind of a standout show for the season. Um, you know I can't go through every single show that was that, we, that got this balance of commerciality and commerce and creativity right but I think other noteworthy ones to kind of just note here and to maybe go and have a look at um, would be Nicolas Gasquier's Louis Vuitton you know this was about a lightness it was about light asymmetrical kind of floating skirts but when these with these kind of time traveler jackets you know some of them reminded me of kind of a 17th century prince's doublet but kind of warped slightly those bulky kind of puff sleeve um, kind of almost leg of mutton sleeve jackets that Nicolas does and of course Louis Vuitton is the most the world's most valuable brand it's worth about 124 billion dollars and it's the jewel in the LVMH conglomerate's eye so it's always to most of us apart from kind of one percent going to be about selling selling a dream um, not a reality um, but what Nicola does and has the power to do in a position as a creative director of Louis Vuitton Women's Wear is to have a global impact in terms of a visual language and an idea of you know how women want to dress and how they want to kind of feel and be in clothing and I think that this collection did even though the product at the end of the day isn't accessible I think as a visual presentation of women and and women and how they dress I think it was a realistic one and um, Peter Doe as well absolute highlight um, 
Peter Doe's collection this season was very much, you know, this comes off the back of his Helmut Lang debut in New York. I do think this, this showing the first in Paris, his namesake label, is really actually what he should have done at Helmet. Um, it felt original, it felt for them, it, not original in terms of, I think what I mean is actually it felt relevant to now. It felt like a product of now. Kathy Horan wrote a brilliant review of Helmut Lang and really hit the nail on the head that what Helmut Lang was doing was responding to his own time and Peter needs to do that and that's perhaps not what he did at Helmut Lang. But this show in Paris for his own brand, it felt like, it felt like a reflection of Peter and the women that he kind of experiences and wants to design for and it felt like as a woman watching this and seeing the women, this was a women's and men's show but I'm thinking very much in terms of women at this point, um, you know this felt like clothes that felt for now, they felt powerful, they felt beautiful, you know, lots of tailoring, Peter has such a great eye for tailoring but just these beautiful elements like slit charcoal grey trousers and then red chiffon would float out of them. Um, again, I'm thinking of red blocks of sh um, blocks of red chiffon on skirts. All of the models did a little twist at one point in the runway. Um, you know, this, this was beautiful. It was an exercise, again, as I say, in balancing commerce and creativity. I also want to talk about Matthew Williams at Givenchy. Matthew's been at Givenchy for a few seasons now and really we can see how his plan and his idea for the Givenchy woman has materialised and grown and is really kind of blossoming this season. Um, I say blossoming as a slight cliche because actually Matthew was thinking about flowers and gardening this season, his own love of them, Monsieur Givenchy's um, own love of flowers um, so flowers were kind of a common motif in this collection but overall it just felt really really chic it felt which is exactly really what she should be the last few seasons that Matthew's been there it's interesting to now look back and actually see how he's been gradually building and building this idea of a woman and this this season was was a really great success it was incredibly incredibly chic ultra luxurious again similar to Louis Vuitton it's within the realms of not being so accessible so it is more in that realm of a fantasy but it feels like it feels like a woman that we can imagine and both see in reality as well let's now talk a bit about who didn't get that balance right who didn't find the balance between product and being and creativity um and creating kind of clothes that felt exciting and relevant. And the first thing brand I want to talk about is Casablanca. That really felt this season that it had lost, lost an interesting point of view. It feels like for the first few, for the last few seasons, it's kind of, it's lost this interesting kind of, it was always this kind of post kind of sports leisure brand, um, but it's kind of, it feels like it's lost that kind of fun element to it and it just feels like clothes for brainless kind of super rich people and to be honest it probably is but it started to feel like that on on the runway and I don't really understand who it's speaking to it's always been about this idea of the ultra rich the ultra luxurious um and but I just I find it un out of I don't find that relevant or current I think it sounds tone deaf slightly um, and yeah I just feel like and I think that was a shame this season because it was held on the um, 63rd anniversary of Nigerian independence um, and it was a collection to kind of honour Nigeria so I don't want to undermine that side of this at all but I just I don't really believe anything that Casablanca do I think after the show when they had live horses there um the last season they did um they did this whole thing about kind of they had a crushed plane on the runway and then we're talking about re refugees and freedom i just find it all a mix of contradictions and i don't really believe them or understand the fantasy that they're selling um balenciaga i'm actually going to slot into my negative section um balenciaga is great by demner but to me, it's lost the creativity. It goes on a formula. That formula, however, is selling so well, both in accessories and in ready to wear. People love it, you see it on the street. So that's obviously a massive, pop, massive kind of positive. 
but I do think it's a kind of formula and model that's that's followed now and I think that actually Demnit is he said he wasn't going to do the idea of the gimmick and I do think he actually did return to that this season although it was kind of a very personal gimmick it was talking um not talking casting kind of people close to him his mother opened the show Linda Lopper his old tutor walked Kathy Horan um, the fashion critic walked in the show and um, Amanda Laporte um, walked in it lots of other people it was this kind of cast of people close to him Eliza Douglas his kind of muse who has often opened the Balenciaga shows the collection itself was a reflection of um, kind of his staples from both his days at Vetmore and then Balenciaga as well so lots of oversized kind of big shouldered tailoring lots of long line silhouettes so jeans that drape on the ground and um, long kind of tops over that and um, that kind of ditzy floral print from markets that he introduced to Balenciaga the camo print from, from Vetmore this kind of mix of staples and signatures which again you know saying this is a negative I think it's very clever it's this reality of people on the street reality of dressing reality of the Balenciaga customer, reality of the Balenciaga fan. But I think my problem with this is that luxury today, and actually luxury today is cosplaying class basically. And there's such a blurred boundary of class in terms of dress and not that that's a bad thing, but there's definitely an issue with, with luxury being this idea of kind of worn kind of torn jeans and market finds that are really cheap but then luxury is making a copy of that in a really really expensive way and I think there's a problem with with the rich dressing as the poor and and there's definitely a discussion to be had there you know this collection debuted a new Balenciaga Atelier label which is all about upcycling I have a problem with that that should just be inherent to your production it shouldn't be that you know it's like privatizing privatizing and making exclusive a more sustainable way of creating fashion that should be accessible to everyone and should be be the norm um and you know i want to read a quote demna said backstage it's about creativity and craft craft um it's not about marketing it's not about business strategies but i just don't believe you can say that when you're at the helm of kering's fourth i think it's their fourth largest brand at the moment and one of the biggest most popular luxury brands in the world um so again, I have a problem there with a with a kind of element of honesty and an element of the reality of of kind of clothing and luxury there. Um, on the flip side of all of this, I want to talk about women because we've just been talking about male creative director after male creative director. You know, where are the women designing for women? Um, there's a real problem in terms with. of exits, in terms of females. We had Gabriella Hurst leaving Chloe, Sarah Burton leaving McQueen. You know, who's going to go in their places? Um, are we going to get different men put at the helms of these brands again? I was talking to Karen Bins, the incredible Karen Bins, who I cannot define by one kind of word of what she does, but she's amazing. But we were having a conversation about what does it mean to be a woman in a man's world? Because that's really what we have to still consider, sadly, in 2023. And in fashion, it feels like that more than ever, that we're women in a man's world. And how do we consider that? And look at the, the clothes. You know, she was saying, Loewe by Jonathan Anson, for instance, felt like these are clothes that were how women could deal with being in a man's world and 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 assert their own kind of position for position in that I think we need to think about how does fashion view and design for women what does it mean in both binary and non-binary terms you know spring summer 24 felt on the surface like a move away from theatrics and gimmicks and more towards the reality of clothes and products but I don't think that was necessarily true about the reality of the wearer and the reality of women um, you know, Beck Victoria Beckham did one of her best collections because she became more open and honest and personal. It was about it was about ballet and ballet growing up, um, about her love of the countryside, you know, big kind of leather, almost welly like boots paired with knitted leotards. Um, you know, it was Comme de Garçon, Ray Kawakubo doing magic there, which is one of the most magic con collections I've had the privilege of seeing. I can't even describe it into words. There's just something incredible about seeing these pieces, which are pure fantasy, but actually are so, 
I can't think of the right word, but they're so moving and deeply throw you back to reality in the sense of when you're when you're watching these shows. You know, we have those those female designers designing for women and doing things well. You know, but we have then Sarah Burton, Leeming McQueen. Um, you know, she's been there for 26 years. This collection was all about thinking about female anatomy, Queen Elizabeth I, the blood red rose, um, you know, the opening cut tailoring look really was kind of a reference to to Lee McQueen, to Spring and Summer 96, to the idea of the power, women and the empowering women and powerful women who have to protect themselves being at the core of the McQueen brand. Um, but ultimately this collection very much to me was still about armour, that we still need armour in the world. And, you know, within that context, I have a problem with collections like Valentino and Dior both proposing, interestingly, and both designers, Pier Paolo, Amira Grazia Curie, proposing their idea of what they think feminism is. And it's actually an idea that I have a massive problem with. Um, you know, it says on the surface it's about empowering women, but really underneath, I think it's a facade. I think it's about product. Um, and both of these ideas of feminism were referencing ideas of women being allowed to say no. I actually ended up finding it insulting because I do think this was just about product. It's not about anything to do with feminism. And both suggested this idea that feminism is about this freedom to be who you are. I don't think you can reduce the freedom to be who you are to when you're at a brand like Valentino or Dior, two of the biggest brands in the world, that it actually does come down to product. It's about a certain identity, a certain person, um, you know, about the kind of ultra rich and, and the 1% of the world. And I just find it insulting to then you know, I think it's important to use that platform to talk about these issues, but I didn't think these did that they did this in kind of realistic or actually truly impactful ways. Um, you know, Valentino was we had an incredible performance by FK Twigs, which was the most moving and empowering part about it. Um, you know, the clothes were really, really beautiful. It was kind of looking at this idea of embroidery and cutting that cutting the embroidery out kind of in inverse and using that as kind of new fabrics, but no, I just found the thing of kind of having, I, th I thought the FK Twigs performance with these dancers was, was this amazing idea of kind of women and empowerment and being able to have your own space, but I didn't see how that, that, that was reflecting off the clothes and I felt like it was kind of, it just turned into the clothes leeching off the performance. Um, Dior similarly so, and um, Maria Grazia always kind of works with a feminist artist of some sort this season she was working on a video instead she kind of put up a video installation by Eleanor Valentoni um and there were kind of it was kind of collage art kind of using 1950s kind of images of women kind of in the kitchen um and slogans such as not her in the space again I just didn't find this truthful or I thought it was just a complete juxtaposition with the context of where we are in the centre of Paris, a, a multi-billion pound show, showing women kind of actually in the same clothes that we see every season from Dior. It wasn't, you know, I just find it surface level and I don't find it truthful and honest. And, you know, that's moving on from those ideas. Then we have Harris Reed and Nina Ritchie, which at least this season, these were better made clothes. The suits are great. Um, look 23, I loved. Um, but there's no empowerment or identity to these. They're clothes, they're fine. We can see them at the Harris Reed namesake label as well. I don't understand why we need these at Nina Ritchie and I don't think it's it's building up this kind of um, heritage French label into, into anything else. And I don't think that, you know, Harris, I think people give too much credit for building up a kind of inclusive community at Nina Ritchie because I don't actually see that happening and the clothes that are these who's buying these clothes is that community getting buying these clothes buying into it I don't think they are and um, so I have a problem with that you know I think it's interesting I'm having a go at kind of both women and men designing for women and um, I do think there was a positive and Milamista this season Ludovic de Saint-Saint-Anne out after one season 
Um, Stefano from the menswear team is now the creative director, Stefano Galici. Um, this is beautiful. It was back to kind of more core and de Milamista roots, the kind of whites, the blacks, the long line silhouette. So kind of long skirts, shirting, tailoring, and um, this kind of long silhouette, as I say, but then with kind of elements of blue and green injected into this. Highlight was the degradé velvet throughout. Got this element of romanticism, dark romanticism and kind of sexuality to it, but not in an objectified way. Last season by Ludwig felt like objectified women. I could not stand those boobs with the and de Milamista feather pasted over the top. I thought it was so insulting to the kind of legacy of the brand and to the women that wear it. So this season I thought it was beautiful. The strength, again, going back to the idea of McQueen, there's still this sense that we need armor, that we need strength coming from these big leather belts. So I thought that was really beautiful, but I do think, again, it brings up this conversation of that these roles are still going to men, they're going to people in the team, which isn't always a bad thing, but you know, it's still this very closed, closed world where we're not giving people the opportunity. Um, and you know, this isn't all to say that straight or gay or queer people cannot design for women and I'm not saying it has to be binary and it has to be just women designing for women it shouldn't be so binary and um, you know we've got amazing people designing for women you know Therese Van Noten, Anthony Vaccarello for Saint Laurent, Julian De Senna for Raban, Olivia Roosting for, Ber for Balmain, um, Andreas Contrale for Vivian Westwood but we need more women and more people who are designing for their people um, and who can hold up in the heat of this commercial market you know, we've got Phoebe Philo returning at the end of this month. You know, you've got the Olsen twins at the row, but we need a more, we need more variety, more inclusion, and a more kind of female, female power this season. Um, and I want to kind of start end end from the beginning with this review because aside from Margiela, which was on Monday evening, kind of the last night of shows, the New York label Vicara, which actually opened Paris, actually. Kind of predicted the note of the season because this show was all about the irony of culture and, and consumerism um and it was for anyone by anyone you know this feeling of diy culture this feeling of that you can mirror these looks you don't need the money to access or access it or buy it but if you do have the money you would want to and um, you know heart by heart and why shoulder bags i love the care t-shirt which references the kind of carrie bradshaw dior um galliano top Wall Street tailoring kind of walked. So that idea of consumerism, trench coats, kind of dress shirts, um, a humorous kind of massive ball, fur closing dress, all the models walking kind of stomping up and down in this kind of paparazzi flashes to reference the noughties and the tens. This idea of kind of, it was like this idea of disguise, identity within media, you know, the power of fashion in that idea of image and how we represent ourselves. And I think that idea of the power of identity is what fashion is about and the designers that aced it this season were the designers that managed to maintain identity while also presenting product and also presenting the idea that you can still have that and you can still dream and, and imagine a little bit um you know the right way forward i think really with fashion is to and what Vicara did so well was they reclaimed a lot of these ideas of kind of you know there were a lot of bootlegging ideas in here um, this idea of that we sell ourselves on social media to be consumed as image, so they reclaim that. And I think if we reclaim the narrative and turn it on its head, that's what real kind of design fashion feminism is. Um, so yeah, lots to think about this season. Um, let me know what you think about lots of things that we've discussed in this in the comments below maybe we can do a follow-up later um later this year and um, but thank you for watching and thank you for joining us this season for all of our reviews um, and look forward to hearing what you think thanks guys bye